much for being here. I'm Laura Ducate, the Faculty Executive Director for the Center for Integrative and Experiential Learning. And I'm excited to be able to moderate this panel today and hear about the exciting things that some of our colleagues are doing. So I'm going to turn it over now to Minuet Floyd to tell us about how she engages students beyond the classroom. And she'll be followed by Karen Edwards and Nate Carnes. And they'll each introduce themselves and tell you a little about themselves before they start. So thanks again for being here today. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Minuet Floyd, and I'm a professor of art education in the School of Visual Art and Design. Uh, I also coordinate the art ed program and direct a children's program called the Young Artist Workshop. Um, so uh, uh, the, I've, I've always been fascinated and curious about study abroad. My first experience was as a graduate student, and um, it was just the best experience that I could have ever had. And so uh, it just kept uh, lingering in my mind that this was something that I should um, try to encourage more students to participate in. And so for me, I, I wanted to incorporate art as a way for students to have those experience abroad, uh, specifically with service learning and uh, other uh, experiential opportunities. So my uh, I've led uh, trips abroad to London, England, and the, that trip, uh, it was a little while back, but it was uh, all about uh, off the wall and into the museum. So we had, we it was a Maymester trip where students had an opportunity to visit uh, a variety of art museums and see artwork uh, up close and in person. Uh, this image that you're seeing here is uh, a, a trip that happened or education abroad experience that happened in 2014 uh, to Ghana, West Africa. The students who participate in my uh, uh, trips abroad are, they come from a variety of majors. Uh, there, were, there was only one art education major who participated uh, that semester. Okay, so, and uh, in 2018, I led a trip to Cape Town, South Africa with a smaller group of students, but again, the students were uh, came from a variety of majors and these, uh, the design of this experience was all about uh, using art as a way to have dialogue and conversations with, with people, not necessarily just children, but also adults. And so one of the things that I've done with my students is uh, they uh, we've used discarded library books and they use that book and they prepare those books with pages so that they can uh, write down their thoughts, they can draw, they can sketch, that you. They did not have to be artists in order to participate in this uh, uh, altered book experience. Uh, these books were, they travel with us. So we, we started with them prior to travel, took them with us. We had lots of opportunities for sitting down even in airports where we, uh, wanted, we were getting to know uh, one another even better. Uh, this is a, one of the students in uh, South Africa. We worked at a, at a child care, early childhood center. Um, this is the experience of working with the teacher and what was already planned for students, but um, they were, my students were very flexible. We collected children's books and we used those books as a way to uh, have dialogue and to also personally to connect to students. Uh, we use the experience of the characters in the books to uh, make personal connections and thinking about the experiences of the students. So. So our goal was basically for the students uh, in this, in these uh, experiential learning uh, spaces uh, was to have uh, both formal and, but mostly informal conversation with students. Uh, we never knew how like the, the, the space would be because as of, you know, when setting up these trips, there are a lot of, of people who are in the middle who are basically helping to set everything up. So we being flexible was a very, very important part of this. I also like to bring in opportunities for the students to meet actual artists. This is an artist who, who uh, used batik as his uh, art form. Uh, basically, it's melted wax on uh, fabric to create designs. Uh, in South Africa, we were able to meet with a social justice mediator who uh, basically try, he met us uh, he met us on several days and we traveled around and we here we were standing up on a uh, on a hill and looking down over the city at uh, the fact that there was a, a prison that was uh, built right beside a school. So we were looking at like some inequity inequities that existed, but also just 
thinking about uh, the um, scenarios of disparities and what happens here in America and what you may experience uh, elsewhere or abroad. Uh, we had an opportunity to go to schools. This is a high school meeting between some of my students and some of the students at one of the uh, local high schools. And they basically uh, participated in an exercise where they wrote down things that bothered them about where they live, things that they were happy about, things that they felt should be changed. And so they came together and they realized that they had a lot in common, that they both, you know, the students in Cape Town and, the, and our students from the United States, they uh, realized a lot of similarities in their concerns and challenges. That one is sort of out of place, but just to show you the size of the images that the students uh, created, uh, I just felt that it was important for them to uh, since this art, this class was designed around art, but also for them to have experiences using art materials. And in some of our pre-orientation sessions, we used a variety of materials just so that my students could become more familiar with the materials um, so that they would feel comfortable in using them and introducing them while abroad. So this is just a two-page spread that was created by a student. Uh, she said, I painted this in complete dark to represent the frequent powder power out outages that we experienced in Ghana. And that was true. And so again, they were documenting their experiences with uh, whether it be visually or through words. And then we had lots of time to reflect. Uh, another uh, important component of the, the travel abroad to South Africa was my students had to use their cell phones to document um, mm -hmm. Uh, what they had questions about, what they learned, and basically uh, they were giving me uh, a view of their travel experience through their own lens. And so these are the next couple of slides are just some of those images of that students focused on themselves and uh, you know what stood out to them. This was at uh, a museum, and this uh, woman is talking about apartheid and. This is at a uh, within a community where people were forced out of their communities uh, and out of their homes. So this was this really resonated uh, with one of my students. Uh, so the next uh, and so that's basically the last image that I'm showing. But I do have a quick video clip that I would like to show. Uh, and this, uh, before you started, this is just to show you how, you know, when I talked about uh, when we had our pre-orientation meetings and we talked about flexibility, not knowing what to expect, but being open to possibilities. So this was just uh, an impromptu sort of dialogue uh, interaction that my students had with some students who lived at a, a, a orphanage. Uh, which was one of the sites that we visited and had an opportunity to work with students and get to know the students. But uh, again, as you look at this, it's just to show you how one person started this idea of, you know, these uh, simple hand claps and then the others just joined in and it became a way for my students to connect and bond with students while abroad. So I will stop right there for now. Thank you, Minuet. I love the idea of the um, using the discarded books for for students to reflect and put their art into. I might have to steal that idea. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Karen to talk a little bit about her engagement. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Karen Edwards and I am a faculty member in the Department of Retailing and I'd like to share with you a few of the examples of beyond the classroom experiences that I've integrated into my face-to-face uh, -face classes, hybrid classes, and online classes. So when we think about what do college students expect, we know that they expect from their education 
career preparation, they expect interesting coursework, and they expect caring professors. So really, they value practical, hands-on, meaningful learning experiences, and that's exactly what experiential learning is all about. So this is kind of a perfect sedge way based on um, what students expect and need. So some of the examples um, that I have, one is I want you to think about exploring whatever partnerships you might have with uh, organizations that are related to your particular field or discipline. This example is the Laws Prevention Foundation. I teach a couple of core courses for retailing students. One is asset protection for retailers and often called uh, risk management or loss prevention. Another is e-commerce or digital retailing. So in my Laws Prevention related course, there is an organization called the Laws Prevention Foundation that is the organization in the United States for uh, retail asset protection professionals. And over the course of a number of years, we were finally able to get uh, together and um, create a partnership where we are actually able to use in our courses the LPF certification, online certification materials that asset protection professionals in the field would use to gain certification. So actually what I do is in this course, which is taught in a hybrid fashion, I meet with the students two days a week and we have a traditional um, type of face-to-face -face course with interactive activities, et cetera. But on their Friday meeting time, in lieu of us meeting, they're actually online working through the LPF course materials. So think about what kinds of organizations you might be able to tap into. Another example that ties in with this idea is in the digital retailing course that I teach. We have a partnership with Wix, which is an online platform for entrepreneurs where you can use the Wix platform to build an e-commerce website. So through working together, we've been able to uh, implement the Wix platform into my coursework so that I teach students about digital marketing strategies and they're actually on their um, at-home work or uh, beyond the classroom online work, they're building an e-commerce website using the principles that they're learning in class, but they're using the Wix platform. So think about that when you're thinking about uh, beyond the classroom experiences. Remember those partner organizations that you might have that provide rich hands-on learning. This is an example of guided discussions, and we all have, you know, since online uh, learning, the pandemic, uh, you know, I've been doing online learning for a long time, but we've all used the discussion boards, right? And just to challenge yourself, I would recommend that you try video discussions. The VoiceThread tool allows you to do that, and the Center for Teaching Excellence can coach you in that tool. But as you're developing your discussion boards, whether they be typed in or a video communications, think about um, topics that are cutting edge. One of the um, goals of my course is to, and I think this one is the asset protection one, um, to have students identify cutting edge issues that are happening in asset protection. So the assignment here is to research that and report back to their colleagues this whatever shoplifting um, tactic they've identified. And then of course, they communicate back with each other. So Think about the guided discussions in terms of your beyond the course uh, classroom experience as well, because you can send them out on mini research assignments and report back to each other and communicate there. Another example I have uh, for you is to explore partnership 
businesses that you might have. I've talked about uh, organizations with the Less Prevention Foundation and WICS, but you might have businesses or other institutions that you can tap into. Um, this is a shout out to the Office of Distributed Learning. Rob Grukett uh, met me at Belk, one of our partner retailers, to actually videotape in 360 and the interior of a store that demonstrates the asset protection tools that are in place. And we're able to create a short video where the students are actually getting up beyond the classroom tour through the miracle of 360 video, um, showing the camera systems, the um, other asset protection tools and devices that are in place in a live store. So think about, uh, this is, a kind of a twofold one for you. Think about the partnerships that you have in terms of businesses and institutions that are related to your field, but also don't forget the resources that we have through the Office of Distributed Learning and the Center for Teaching Excellence. They're there to help you, all right? All right, what else do I have for you? Let's see here. Ah, yes. Um, I give a beyond the classroom assignment uh, that supports the you know, learning objectives, of course, and that is an interview. And interviews aren't anything new. You might say, well, you know, they do this in their basic 101. Well, if you assign or when you assign beyond the classroom field interviews, I recommend that you make them very um, pointed, give them guided instructions, and link it to the learning objectives so that students know what the assignment is and why it's uh, important, how it supports their learning. I usually set up my assignments with uh, an introduction. This assignment ties in with learning objective number one, XYZ, whatever, and then provide pointed um, instructions. Here, I give the students the assignment of finding someone who's in the field doing a job that they could actually see themselves doing it upon graduation. So what I'm doing is I'm setting it up so that they're going to be able to look at their future career through the lens of someone who is doing that job. And then to tie it in with the things that they are learning in class. Very often we have students who have no real field experience. And so talking with these professionals in the field and tying in their course learning with what's actually happening in their future career and then having them and this is the key reflect upon what all this means to them right how are they going to use it in the future why is this enlightening to them etc so don't forget to integrate a reflective piece into each assignment that you give but interviews are very useful but don't leave them too generic or they're going to come back to you from students with, oh, you know, that I asked the question of what got you into this field. That's not really advancing the learning in many cases. So um, in this case, I have them ask very clearly asset protection related questions. Here I have an example for non-COVID or non-pandemic um, times. And this is where I'm actually sending the students into a retail establishment of their choice where they apply the learning that they have uh, gained through the classroom exercises, readings, and the like, and now actually go into a store and identify what asset protection tools are in place in this store. All right, so you saw where I gave them uh, discussions, you saw where I gave them the interview as well as um, the video of different asset protection tools, etc. Now I've got them actually taking that learning and going into a, uh, a retail store, looking around, looking for those asset protection tools and identifying what's in place making recommendations on what could be done better 
from an asset protection standpoint, what they're doing right. So I'm enabling them to analyze and integrate all the learning in a um, project. For retailers, this is pretty easy because it's easy to get into a retail store. I recognize for some of you, particularly in education or healthcare, it's not as easy to just have your students stroll in one of those establishments. So you have to do a little bit of planning depending on your particular field. Um, I want to point out that reflection is an integral part of what we do and in addition to building in reflection into each of the assignments that I give my students, I also have them maintain for themselves and with only me reviewing a personal learning reflective post after each unit. And my classes are usually um, divided into three units, but uh, I recommend having the reflective blog post completed just before their unit quiz. Um, helps them tie the ideas that they've learned all together. And this particular example, which you might want to, and you might already be familiar with, but you might want to look up, is based on the Ash and Clayton deal model. And uh, Patty Clayton was one of our guest speakers or our, our uh, keynote speaker actually at one of the October Vest uh, events hosted by the Center for Teaching Excellence and it basically says this um, DEAL stands for describe your learning experience examine how this um, relates across your disciplines and articulate the learning and what it means to you in the future one thing I normally do is I explain to my students the research and the rationale behind what they're doing. So in my courses, we talk about, about critical reflection and how it helps us to learn and the research that's behind it. Then I give them the specific details on how to do this best and provide them the tool and give them some, again, very guided um, instructions on how to make the most of this exercise. So I use, I've been using the DEAL model ever since Patty came to campus and it's gone really well. And then the last thing I wanted to show you was um, a similar kind of field exercise that I give to my graduate level students and this is after they learn about the Americans with Disabilities Act and how it requires us to have our physical buildings accessible as well as our websites accessible. And in this course we learn, we do readings, watch videos, um, talk to each other, have guest speakers uh, regarding compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act and then I give them an assignment to go into a retail store during non-pandemic times and assess the assess accessibility of that store, make recommendations on how it could be improved and then to also do the same thing with the website. Now obviously during the pandemic not being able to um, send students into retail stores, I've had them simply assess the accessibility of the websites, but this is a very hands-on learning experience that helps them pull together and integrate the learning that they've had across the curriculum. So those are my examples and uh, you are free to use any of them um, and uh, or not, uh, but I hope that they've been just a little bit of insight that will get your creative juices flowing and how these might apply for you. So with that, I will turn it over to Nate. Okay, yes, thank you very much to Minuet and Karen, of course to Laura also, who is, um, orchestrating all of this. I really appreciate it. I am Nate Carnes. I have a dual appointment as um, Associate Director of Center of Teaching Excellence and I'm also a faculty member in the College of Education. I'm one of the science educators there. I want to just note some uh, courses in which we um, do some integration of uh, uh, experiential learning. Uh, within the courses to make the material come alive for the students, even though you're looking at a very static image. I um, also want to um, highlight uh, contributions of uh, Dr. Jimmy Gahagan 
and Laura Duquet. Uh, this goes back into the days where we uh, were focusing a lot on service learning. Uh, I did not purposely prepare a slide for that because I wanted to re um, limit my slides. But service learning is about uh, our students within our courses rendering a service to a community partner. And in doing so, they are applying uh, some of the, or as much of the content within the course out during their service or rendering service to the community members. So I want to just briefly run through courses and then talk a little bit about the context in which all this happened and then I'll pull back so that we can have time for questions. The first one, these are courses that I have taught. The first one is EDTE 201 or 201 called Issues and Trends in Teaching and Learning. This is a course that our teacher candidates in the early childhood, elementary, and middle level degree programs take early in their, uh, their programs. And we do that to, uh, because one of the things we face is a large turnover in the teaching force. For example, there's one statistic that says that we lose about half of people going into the education profession um, within their third year. And that has been very alarming to us. And we, we keep searching for reasons why this is happening. One of the things that pops up is that we need to acclimate them to the environments in which they're going so that they're better prepared and can adjust and develop coping mechanisms to stay and experience less I'll say cultural shock as they go in. So the issues and, and trends in teaching and learning is one of the courses where we tend to incorporate integrated and experiential learning. They're not really doing much in this course ex, uh, uh, beyond observations. So we send, we have school partners to which they go and they record uh, what is happening there. They bring that back. Um, Karen hit on a very important word for us, which is reflection, uh, because we then tend to reflect on what they experienced. And I tend to provide them with an analogy of a mirror. So when they make statements during the course or uh, suppositions, then I'll ask, what mirror are you using? The EDML 321 course is the middle level teaching and management course that I developed um, in which in this course we kind of raise it up a little bit uh, or, or yeah elevate expectation a little bit that they're doing more than observations but they actually do a service um, taking from uh, what they're learning in the course to do the service particularly monitoring students I just have a little story for this and <clears throat> just a real quick uh, incident. Um, I was also uh, a liaison to one of our middle schools and we uh, took the EDML 321 class there and taught the, um, the basic principles of middle level teaching and management specifically on behavior management and implementing discipline. How do you do it? How do you motivate students? That sort of thing. So one year we coupled with the school in that we provided uh, uh, extra bodies to monitor students in an after school program. So one day, one thing, what happened was uh, a large African American male got into a fisticuff with uh, a, a much smaller uh, male who I think was Latino. Uh, or actually he was biracial. I'm mentioning the, these, uh, the races for a reason. What I had done was taken different ones of the class and staked them out at different parts of the cafeteria in which a lot of the beginning of the after school program took place. Um, and being a liaison at the school, I had uh, uh, a perspective of what was happening throughout the school day. My class did not, because they were only there for the class meeting, which was toward the end of the day. So um, this um, conflict rose between these young boys, these young adolescent boys, and they got into a really big fight. I mean, they were throwing punches. The student that I placed there was a Caucasian female who was kind of small, 
in size. And I think she kind of, she was tall enough that her head probably brushed the shoulder of the larger African-American male. So when they got into this really big fisticuff, she took off running toward me away from them. Her eyes were very big. <laughs> and so I passed her and headed to the, the young adolescent bo uh, boys who were fighting and uh, stopped the fight and addressed both of them. So that became a learning experience of what we were talking about in class, but they were able to see it in real life. So, and all the whole class saw it because the whole class was in the cafeteria at the time. So we had opportunity to sit down and debrief. It's like, what principles was I teaching in the course did you see me use? And so um, we didn't have as many dramatic episodes like that but it was one in which it made the course particularly powerful and they saw me as a teacher who has a lot of teaching experience under his belt, how to deal with it and how calmly I dealt with it. And of course they had lots of questions. Uh, the remaining two courses on this slide, uh, the EDML 598, that's an internship in a middle school. This internship actually touches all the methods courses that we teach in the senior year. And they, uh, they actually begin practicing teaching, developing lessons, taking what we're using in the courses that we're teaching out in the various schools in which they are placed. And then in EDML 599, it's called student teaching, where they gradually move into the role of a teacher until they take full responsibility and then they gradually back out of it to um, uh, hand things back over to the teacher. So that's just kind of like a flavor integrated and experiential learning there. And if you have questions, hopefully we'll have time to entertain them uh, before this session is over. I want to quickly go to the next slide to say all these courses and all hinge on what we have in the College of Education. It's called our conceptual uh, education conceptual framework. And I'm going to go uh, down from the bottom up, just like I'm going in reverse of looking at the specific experiences and going to the broader piece where we uh, at the very bottom you see dispositions the dispositions are things that they need to have to enact the knowledge that we're going to give them into the practice so uh, the root system goes into the knowledge which is drawing from the dispositions and and then up into the practices the practices are what they are going to begin to implement in these uh, uh, field-based experiences in the EDTE 201 course, the EDML 321 course, the EDML 598, and the EDML 599 course. Uh, so all that frames that. Um, and then we go on to, we have, the, our university has the US, U of SC PDS, is stamp, PDS stands for Professional Development School Network, which has been in force since uh, 1990. As you can see, it was first established there. Within this network, there are five middle schools. And I'm saying middle schools because that's my area. Uh, sites that we work with, they are special because that's also where faculty are involved and we do research at those um, sites. And the big word that joins us all together is simultaneous renewal. So our, our teacher candidates are going out seeking to learn. The teachers that are there who are called coaching teachers are seeking to gain additional knowledge to grow themselves. And so they get a type of professional development. And people like me who come in as a university liaison, we gain also because one, it keeps me fresh with middle school because I taught you know, middle level 16 years before I went to the university. Um, and I actually go back and still uh, teach at some of the schools so that the teachers can see what the theory looks like in practice. And we sometimes tape them so that the teacher candidates can also see and then we debrief. We also have several partnership sites that are attached to our middle level program, like it is for early childhood, elementary, and our secondary program. Partnership uh, sites are different than the professional development sites in that there's, there's not that component of research 
and so much of the, uh, the simultaneous renewal is not as explicit, but our teacher candidates still have opportunities to learn from the best, the brightest, the most experienced as they're going through. They also see that the profession that they go in is much more messier than what we address during the courses. But we try to help them to see how what we're teaching fits in the professional community to which they are going. Um, finally, the teacher, we have teacher preparation standards. There's the South Carolina, this is at the state level, teaching standards 4.0, which has a list of competencies that our candidates must uh, learn and exhibit uh, to a certain degree. We, this is also used with professional teachers in South Carolina, but our teacher candidates are scored at a different level because they were more forgiving. <laughs> and they don't have uh, the experience maybe to accomplish those uh, competencies, but we expose it to them before they get into the profession so that they will be on the road to excellence. And in the middle level, we also have teacher preparation standards that have five standards and 17 elements, which guide that we incorporate that also into the coursework. So that's where the integrated and experiential learning is. This is kind of a long-winded way of saying, in addition to what Karen was saying about um, reflection, and Minuet was talking about, you know, taking them out to different, uh, you know, beyond the classroom experiences, that it's uh, very important that we, you have uh, partners who are going to benefit from where the students go, as well as benefit. Uh, uh, that they get a benefit and the teacher candidates get a benefit. So that's where that simultaneous renewal comes in. And when you have that piece, then everybody has the game and it makes it a wonderful experience. It also keeps your community partners on the hook for a while because they know that they're going to get some quality of it themselves. Um, so I have a, a few questions for everybody um, to learn a little bit more about your motivations for getting your students outside the classroom and challenges you've encountered. And I think the first question we've covered, but um, but maybe you can give us a little bit more information. Um, so how did you first decide to have your students engage in beyond the classroom and experiential learning? Um, because I think it's it takes a little bit more time um, but how did you decide that it was worth that and that, and that you wanted to have your students go beyond the classroom anyway? <laughs> I'll go first, uh, if, if Karen and Minuet don't mind. <laughs> Education, uh, I, I say this not in a pious manner, by any means. Uh, we, in the teacher education, we have been at this for a very long time. We started doing some shifting toward this way uh, as early as uh, the early 1970s, which is when I was going through my teacher preparation program, that they start, they wanted to get us out in the classrooms earlier to make our learning more meaningful. And I think that's the whole point uh, of uh, these integrated and experiential learning processes anyway, is to make what we say is like, look, I'm not just a talking head and I'm not trying to pass time, but I'm actually trying to connect you to where you're going in a, a knowledgeable way. And so uh, we have slowly started implementing this earlier and earlier in the teacher pr preparation program. One, so that people can really decide that, yes, this is a profession that we want to go in. Uh, Laura, I don't remember the statistic, but we have people who change their majors more than once, going from their freshman to their to, to graduation. So doing this, you know, we were doing this to try to uh, expose them to where they're going in. This is really what you want to do, right? We are here all the pieces. And it's also messy. So a lot of times you get questions like, exactly how do I do this or that? And life isn't quite that simple, unfortunately. Thank you. And I would like to say for uh, for me personally, it was it was about the experience that I had and how it impacted me. But uh, I felt that just 
uh, that art has so much power and that you can use it in so many ways and you know uh, in interdisciplinary ways and when you're engaged and involved that you sometimes don't realize what you're learning until it's over so it you know it becomes something that is fun uh, the activities for the students were very some of them were very impromptu but uh, with my students being prepared to keep in mind that flexibility is key and that's one of the things that really paid off for them and for me i come from a background of um, industry experience i was a human resources manager among other things in uh, the field of retailing i did a lot of corporate training of managers a lot of new management um, training and I quickly learned back then that in our field, as with so many things, you really learn by doing. And learning it from reading or from talking to someone is different than actually applying the skills and being able to hone and practice and synthesize. So being aware of this hands-on benefit, um, it translated very easily uh, for me uh, in my retailing courses. So it, it was a natural, I think, for our field in particular. And maybe you started to address this too, all of you, but what do you feel are some of the key benefits? So when you used to talk about flexibility, um, the hands-on part, but um, other sort of key benefits that you see students coming out of these experiences with? Yes, uh, one, uh, one key uh, uh, factor was the fact that uh, it takes you out of your comfort zone. And so just that sometimes you just don't know. And when you tr when traveling abroad, you might have not have control over all of the circumstances, even as the the person who set up and led the trip, uh, the experience, I didn't always know what to anticipate. And so uh, we just had to sometimes just go with the flow and just, uh, you know, they realized a lot about themselves and how they, how they acted when things didn't go as planned. But they also observed their peers and how they interacted or reacted or, you know, responded to whatever that circumstance may have, be, have been at the time. I have found that with, um, for example, with the uh, interview assignment where students talk to somebody who's actually doing the job that they will be doing upon graduation, that they 90% of the time come back enthused, you know, very excited and also almost surprised that what they learned in class from me is what's really happening in the field. I, you know, <laughs> I don't know, but um, it, they're able to tie it together and they're able to see that it really is relevant and that they really will need this and how it fits together. So it's almost, many of the exercises are almost like an epiphany for students because it's, um, it's the realization that, hey, I'm going to need this, and hey, what I'm learning is relevant. Well, ditto to what both of you said, really. Um, I say this uh, with humor because they come back and they talk to me about uh, what they, we were with real teachers, so I guess I'm not real, but, but they do come back quite excited and said, this is just what we talked about. Uh, but it also, they come back with questions, you know, say, well, this is what we um, uh, address in our course. And it looked a little different out in the field. And that generates some really genuine, thoughtful uh, questions. And I also, and I'll stop here. It also provides that when you have a really good community partner, they get another instructor for the same tuition price. Yeah, that's a good point, Nate. And I think the community partner is a key piece of what several of you have said, too. So what Karen was saying, that to really think about how you can leverage your community partners. Um, so how did you, I mean, I think in education, it's a little clearer because there are partner schools that we work with. But 
Um, maybe this question is to Karen. How did you go about contacting these partners and getting them excited about what you wanted to do and getting them to agree to it? Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that to give people ideas of how they could even start that conversation. Sure, I'll be happy to. You know, for our um, discipline, the industry partnerships are so important um, in terms of getting our students their internships and future jobs that we all pretty much work as a team to keep those connections going and sharing with each other. Uh, so one of the ways we do that is through uh, guest speakers. We invite people to campus or virtually to Zoom in, talk to students, this kind of thing. So it's, it really is. Um, a lot of relationship building, calling on those relationships that I've had in the past and calling on them or probing and saying, you know, all right, I've got this topic that I really want to drive home to students, this, this learning objective. What do I want to build and who is most likely to help me with it? You know, if you are a faculty member there saying, you know, I don't have a lot of those connections from years of industry experience or what have you. You'd be amazed what LinkedIn will get you or any of the, you know, research-based um, platforms or what have you. But I've had incredible luck with introducing myself to someone on LinkedIn who's in industry who will literally answer you. There is another website that I think it's called Rocket Research or Rocket something, where if you're looking to find somebody in a particular industry or at a certain organization, you type in that position and it will help you find it. I can't recall that link uh, right now, but I'll share it later. But LinkedIn is really helpful, and this Rocket whatever um, is another one if you don't have the contacts. Um, but don't be shy. You'll be amazed at who is willing to um, help you. I have found that most professionals are really jazzed and honored to be asked for their um, input and they really do want to give back and they really do, you know, in our field, they really want to connect with the students anyway because they want to recruit them for jobs after. Um, so, so get with your internship director if you have one, your corporate engagement officer if you have one, or just, you know, don't be afraid to cold call. I've had really good luck. Okay, thanks. Um, I really like the assignment you have of having them interview someone and what they think will be their future position because I imagine students have an idea of what that looks like and then once they talk to someone, maybe it either it's exactly what they thought and that's great or maybe it, it's not quite what they imagined. So that's a, a great assignment. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Could you all talk about some of the challenges that you've encountered? Yes, I could start here. So I've, I feel that one of my biggest challenges, especially when setting up art experiences, is the not knowing how many students or children we would be working with. Will we be working in a classroom? What uh, Will we have tables? Uh, would there be access to some water that we will be able to use? And so oh, when uh, after that, the travel abroad to South Africa, I really started thinking more about that. And so uh, I was fortunate uh, few, about two semesters ago to have an experience of setting up a uh, trip to Kenya for a site visit. And so I uh, went through a travel provider, but I basically set up my own itinerary of meeting with organizations. Uh, we were planned to be, uh, we would have been working with a group of women with special needs. We would have been working uh, at a school with children. And so I was able to complete that uh, uh, in about five days in Nairobi, Kenya and Brackenhurst. Um, and so unfortunately that was December, 2019 and the May semester would have happened in 2020. And so it was all canceled, but I just, I was able to see just, you know, being able to go there and see firsthand the spaces and get to meet and interact and ask questions. That was just so, uh, it was so beneficial for me, even though we did not have that experience, I didn't have that experience with students yet, uh, it's still not off the table. So I'm hoping that we will still be able to uh, experience Kenya using 
some of the same uh, strategies and techniques that we use in uh, South Africa and Ghana. So as much prep as you can do, it sounds like, um, to, to get rid of yeah. some of the unknowns, it's a good way to handle that. Yeah. Well, I want to jump in on that too quickly, Laura, that uh, it would be difficult in Minuet situation, but technology allows us. Um, I think I heard you say, Minuet, when you, if, if at all possible, uh, go to the site, if you can. Uh, or at least uh, communicate with the community partner so that they are not only understanding of the students coming, but of what your learning outcomes are. That's why I strongly recommend sharing your syllabus with them and, you know, kind of going through uh, what you need to do. Laura, I would also say one of the biggest challenges, particularly with education, anyway, and Karen, I'm not sure how this fits in your profession, but. Uh, there's in our profession we talk about theory and practice and I really didn't point it out with that tree but we believe theory into practice and this is what I have told my partners uh, some of them do actually think that way they think in those uh, well you all teach the theory we do the practice and I tell them well if theory has no practical implications it will not stand as a theory and any practice that is informed and consistent would not exist unless there's a theoretical framework that's holding it together. So that's how it goes. And Laura, could I say one more thing? So, you know, one of the things that, have, that has happened with probably all of us since COVID is just uh, ex, uh, exploring and learning more about the possibilities of virtual formats and virtual platforms. And so I have since that time corresponded with some of the teachers at one of the schools. So, you know, we're able to uh, stay in touch that way. Uh, also this semester, I led a faculty abroad, uh, faculty and staff uh, virtual um, education abroad experience to Ghana. And so we're, we just finished up on Monday, but just, you know, we were able to incorporate art and dance. So we had a, a dance uh, instructor who is uh, originally from Ghana, who led us through a dance experience. And we, you know, we ate food. Uh, that was a little bit of, you know, being able to go into a restaurant to pick up food. So there's so many possibilities. And so I probably changed some of uh, my, I've changed some of my thinking about the possibilities because I know that virtual, you know, communication is there. Yeah, I think we have so many more options that we never knew were available, that were there, but we now realize the options um, that we can do virtually. And just so that's been a good learning experience. And, um, you know, now Study Abroad is offering global learning experiences virtually. And, um, and Karen, of course, has led one. Um, Karen, do you want to talk about any challenges? I, you know, it's funny. I had uh, was thinking through that and both Nate and Minuet uh, hit the topics that I think are the biggest things and, and planning for sure is a huge issue. You, you can't just throw it together. You need planning, especially with the study abroad experiences. I'm all for those planning uh, trips. They make a huge difference. And then as Nate mentioned also, um, tying it into to the learning objectives. You, you need to start with the learning objectives and then plan your learning experiences based on what the student should be able to do by the end. So, you know, it's not just for fun and frolic, right? Although very often it is fun um, to engage in beyond the classroom experiences, but they're actually very well planned, um, rational, uh, pointed learning um, experiences to support the overall objectives. So the only other thing I had as far as the challenge here was just sometimes the inspiration, like what should I do? And I think that's where um, groups like this would really help because the more we talk to faculty, people who are doing it, um, people in industry, you know, people across the board. I'm learning from Nate and Minuet, and I know that the rest of the participants have other ideas that I could get something from. So I think the sharing and the um, making the opportunities available for us to do more cross-disciplinary discussion 
examples, sharing. I would encourage everyone who's out there who's doing something great to submit a proposal for October Best here through CTE. That's one of the best ways to get great ideas and see what's going on across campus. So become involved and, you know, it takes a little extra work, but it is so worth it. So I think that we can inspire each other. Thank you, Karen. That's a really good point. Yeah, every time I talk to people from different areas of campus, I learn so much um, just about what's going on on campus and then get great ideas just like I did today from you all. So my last question, and then we'll give people time to ask some questions. Um, what advice do you have for someone who's trying to incorporate experiential learning into their class for the first time? Okay. So I would say uh, just having, uh, think about the the end, start maybe with the end in mind and uh, having a clear vision of like the activities and how it might fit into your course, into your unit or your lessons, uh, but also leaving some space for students to have that a little bit of flexibility in examining their own ideas uh, so that it's not so rigid for them and that they can explore and they can, you know, can react and they can uh, consider their own ideas and how they might be impactful. Yeah, I think, um, again, you know, the end in mind, the backwards design, which I know that uh, Laura has spent time with Karen Minuet, uh, just keep just keep your eyes on the prize. It, I would say it is more work, but it's worth it especially when their eyes brighten up when they come back they can't wait to tell you what happened or what they have seen or even in many west case they're together but still that discussion continues um it, it's anything here's the way i put it with my students uh rome was not built in a day and it didn't fall in one day either so you know what you put your 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 strength into and it brings out your passion it helped i think there's we haven't talked about this much but uh i have been invigorated a lot going to the schools and all i say yes i am in the right profession still and oh i just thought of something else that i could bring in and also i get some cheap professional development because when we be, when we're at the university you know, they talk about the, the big white castle and all, of, you know, that's away from everybody, but it keeps you in tune with what's going on with in the context of your course. And um, it's already been said, it's surprising what, what you can learn still along with the students. I would agree with both of those points and um, just remind everybody to build in reflection, even small pieces of reflection on each assignment. But what I'd really like to leave people with is that this is continuous improvement, that you try one particular field experiment, right? You, you try one beyond the classroom exp uh, experience. And as Nate said, how can I tweak that? What can I add? You're never done. I try to try one thing new every semester and I let my students know what it is. This semester we're going to try whatever and see how it goes. I'd like your feedback and you know we're, we're going to do this or what have you. But continue to build, improve, keep yourself up on what the research and um, education is so that you know read the you know qep plan for experiential learning right and um just just strive toward making subtle improvements every term or every time you offer a course and you'll be surprised at um what a wonderful finished product you can end up with and it's never really finished which is part of the fun those are all great examples, and um, I like your point, Nate, that it, it keeps us fresh, too, to get outside the classroom ourselves and, and not just get stuck in what we're doing. And it's a good advice, Karen, to try something new, just something little every semester, and that keeps us excited, too. Does anyone have any questions? You can um, unmute yourself or um, put your question in the chat, and we'll try to answer it. 
So we have all these experts. This is a great opportunity to ask any questions you'd like about experiential integrative learning. Perhaps um, there is someone who has an example too that they'd care to share that they have tried. Great, here we go. Um, comment on one way to increase and measure engagement regarding your lessons. Okay, one, uh, I'll try to um, see if this answers the question. One of the big things, um, I think all three of us have made mention of thinking about the end in mind. Uh, and when you have an assessment, I don't want to say too much of this because that this would probably take us in another direction. But when we are developing those assessments to capture the experiential integrated learning, it's extremely important to give some thought to scoring rubrics and criteria um, that you have. Because what you have to do, you have to concretize your expectations for the students. You know, it's kind of like any other sign you I know many of us would we give an assignments and we say um, does anybody have any questions and someone says well I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do well what about this is this right is this okay rubrics help you allay those kinds of questions I'd like to add also um, uh, kind of uh, building on that and tying in a point that a minuet had brought up about uh, allowing for creativity. Um, very often we assess via, <clears throat> pardon me, tests um, and, you know, especially with online, you know, we kind of rely on a big pool of test questions and that kind of thing. And, and I get that, but to really measure um, whether this learning experience has hit home, I think the reflection is so important. So I would encourage you if you're not using a blog to have the student do that. But also if you are assessing via tests and exams to strive to use um, short answer or essay or some kind of applied demonstration where students can um, unpack their learning and apply it in um, a context. Um, so that will help you get a finger on the pulse of whether the activity that you planned is actually delivering what you had hoped. Um, also, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, it's hard, the larger your courses are, um, the harder it is, but what I'm going to try for my next semester is making virtual appointments with each and every student to debrief on these instead of having them write something, you know, some communication so I can flesh out with some Q&A. So those are just a couple of ideas, but remembering, Mike, yes, you know, that measuring our success is so important. You can't just assume that what you're doing is working. We really need to um, assess appropriately and, and through meaningful communication, um, we get a much better handle on it. Yeah, and so one of the things that I did not mention earlier when my students uh, use their cell phones to capture their, uh, you know, their, the experience, the questions they had, what they, um, you know, what they saw, that became an actual photo exhibit. So we had a, an exhibition in McMaster College in our student gallery, and those students were invited over and they invited friends and other uh, few uh, people and faculty from campus came over to see their works and to read their uh, their text statements or visual the essays that accompanied the photographs and so they engaged in dialogue with people who were observing their work. We have two more questions. Thank you, Minuet. Um, as a TA, I may be more limited on what I can get the students to do. What types of learning activities could I implement to get them involved in and out of the classroom? So I'll, of course, let you all answer, but this reminds me of what Karen was talking about with sort of these smaller, like it's not a service learning activity for the whole semester, but what activities sort of sprinkled throughout, um, they, or even one activity to get them outside of the classroom. but um, Karen and others, you can 
Yeah. I'll point out that, you know, I'm glad you asked that because it reminded me of one that I actually did have my TA um, manage for me. We, we had my graduate student lead a tour of a store in which they were looking at different aspects. And in fact, it was um, a, an early iteration of the asset protection systems assessment that the students did. Um, actually, our partners at the Russell House Bookstore were kind enough, and you'd think, okay, well, I've been to the Russell House Bookstore a million times, right? Um, what can I learn there? But looking at it from this other angle of, what are they doing to manage traffic flow and um, reduce shoplifting and keep, you know. So my graduate assistant knew a lot about this topic and she was able to uh, meet the students at the Russell House bookstore and give them the tour pointing things out. So that was a really useful tool um, as well. So some of the learning experiences can be developed for um, TAs. And TAs probably, if you've got a great one, which it sounds like you are, Sarah, um, you probably have some pretty cool ideas there too. Well, and Sarah too, I mean, if you're the TA of the, your course and you're the main teacher of your course, I think maybe you could try to implement one of these, like what Karen was talking about or think of what, I don't know what your field is, but think of a way that you could have them sort of get outside the classroom and, and see your field in action, just maybe with one small assignment. Nate, I, you're probably gonna jump in on this, but I, I really wanna get to this last question in our last two minutes, because this comes up so often. How do you help the students be successful in their self-reflection without being intrusive in the process? And I hear this, not so often, but I've heard this from enough people that it is a topic that reflection is intrusive and, and we shouldn't be asking students to share these kinds of thoughts with us and feelings. So maybe you all can talk a little bit about that. Um, in this last minute, we have one minute. <laughs> Go. Actually, I was going to be real direct with that one, Laura. Um, and, and I don't want to overtax your office. I, there are different ways that you can do this. In, in a sentence, I would say contact um, Laura's office because she has great staff members that can give you specific and concrete uh, examples that would answer this question. I would just quickly add that make sure the students know that it's only you and them that have access to their blog or whatever the tool is. And I have found that students like that format and they will actually talk to me. And thank you for pointing out this or that because that really helped me think what through what have you. So I have not had any student um, con be concerned about that, but also um, let them know it's a safe environment that you're not there to be judgmental. Yeah. And I would like to say quickly, it's uh, part of it is developing a rapport with the students and getting to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with the travel abroad, you're in very close quarters because you're with one another all the time. So th some of those experiences that you have are, they open you up to having conversations and feeling more trust and being able to talk with one another, but it can be challenging too. And I'll just add, um, as I wrap up, um, giving them some guidance on how to reflect as well. So hearing the word reflection might feel a little bit scary to students, but like Karen talked about using the deal model, give them some some questions to guide them, talk together about, um, about what reflection means and different ways to look at it, and that can help too and make it feel maybe less intrusive. Thank you all, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much to our moderators. I learned so much, and I'm sure everyone, all the attendees did too. Thanks, everyone. I enjoyed being on the panel. Thank you, Laura. You did a great job. Yes. Thank you all.